This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster. And this is the 200th episode of the All Access Star Trek podcast. So we decided to do something special. First of all, I just want to say happy 200, Lori. Yeah, happy 200. That is kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I, you know, when this started, I, I had no idea. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad that we did this. I was so scared when we started because, you know, I feel confident doing what I do. But uh, I wasn't really a pot, you know, I was, wasn't a podcaster. I was I write and I do interviews and stuff like that. But it, this is a whole new thing for me. Yeah, I don't have confidence doing anything I do. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's been a big confidence booster for me that we've that people actually listen, that people respond. We've met people who listen to the podcast. Someone we've came done- to your book reading last week. Yes, Mike. Thank you, Mike. That was lovely of you to do. Yeah. And we've had so many great interviews, like a ton of people that I never thought we would have. This week being amongst them. Yes. Right? <laughs> um, the person at the top of our list when we thought who would be special would be... Jonathan Frakes. Of course. Who we've had before. You And, and usually it's like tied to something, Picard or, you know, a charity or something. But And like you have 11 minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Yeah. You have nine and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to roll that in, in in a minute. We're not going to do a news wrap up uh, next week. We are going to cover the news. Next week is going to be packed because New York Comic Con is this weekend. Lori's going. There's a big Star Trek panel. You know, they're going to be announcing stuff. So keep your eye on the site. We're going to be doing interviews. Lori's doing interviews. I'm doing interviews. So there's going to be a lot of stuff coming on Section 31 and Lower Decks and maybe surprises. So Yeah, who knows if they'll sneak in a little Starfleet Academy something something. Yeah, and we've already started. There's like an article about ships revealed, uh, you know, from Fan Home. There's merchandise stuff on the site. So the New York Comic Con stuff has already started. But because it's a long interview, let's get into it with our friend. And yours. Uh, <laughs> and yours. <laughs> friend of the pod, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Not that he listens to it, but we understand. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jonathan Frakes. All right. Well, I want to welcome our favorite guest, Jonathan Frakes. Your oldest guest. Your, <laughs> your best. You know, we had Lawrence Luckenbill on. Oh, uh, fair enough. <laughs> he wins. What's so nice is this is our 200th episode. You're not here to pitch anything. You're, you know. The, the, oh, you don't know that. Well, maybe you are, <laughs> but you know, I, I reached out and got an immediate yes. And I just, we so much appreciate you coming on to celebrate our 200th episode of the all access Star Trek podcast. Well, you are one of those, uh, I've been doing this with you for a long time. And, uh, if you ask, I come. Oh, that's so sweet. That's awesome. Thank you. There is kind of something to pitch. You, you've already done it, although I don't know if there's more to it. But you know, we've recently covered the Trek the Vote event you did with Crooked Media supporting the Harris Waltz campaign. Right? Is, is this something new? For I don't remember you kind of actually endorsing a candidate, getting me. You know what, what's I, behind I, I, it? I I was um, very cautious and decisive about not getting into politics because it's such a it's such a bad look when all those haters come out and I'm, I hate the haters, <laughs> but this election is more important to me than hating the haters. So I was very happy. I was, for instance, when Hillary was running, we had the uh, Stacey Abrams hosted that fabulous uh, trek out the vote. Oh, but, that was great. Mm, that was wonderful. And she ended up with a gig out of that after that as whatever she was, the president or something on discovery. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So this, this roundup, because Jerry is so involved, she's a good friend of mine, and and uh, it just felt like it's silly not to if people come. Delarco asked me to do that one, and then we did another one to trek out the vote, and we did a Zoom, and there's more to come. I, I just I think it's never been more important. So I'm I'm kind of all in, and I love her, and I love I love <laughs> I love Walls too. I got to say, yeah. He reminds me of a guy from Pennsylvania who I probably grew up with. So it's a, uh, which I'm sure everyone feels, but I'm terrified of the, of the uh, narcissism and stupidity of the orange menace. So uh, I'm happy to endorse our new leader. And then <laughs> that one that you did was a comedy show. Was that oh fun my to God. do? The guy who hosted John, John Levitt. Levitt. 
first of all, our family is huge Survivor fans. Both of my kids got us into it, which I can't believe. But Jeannie and I, Jeannie and I, and I wait for Wednesday night. So the new Survivor season started about two weeks ago. And John Levitt, who I loved, I thought, this guy's going to be fucking great on this show. I had no idea who he was. And I walked into this thing over at, uh, we did it over at Sirius in, in Hollywood. And I said, you're the, and then I thought, oh, my God, I've already got it out there. I said, it sucks that you got thrown off the show. He said, you have no idea. And he had to stay in um, Fiji so that he wouldn't show his face until the show aired so people wouldn't, right? And he got kicked off in the first episode. He's a yeah. huge fan, you know, because he's got this big podcasting career. You know, him and all his Obama buddies have, you know, one of the maybe the biggest political podcast. And it was a huge deal for him. So I feel really bad for him getting kicked off in the first episode. So. I did. I did, too. But what a wonderful host he was for that uh, Trek event. Oh, yeah. He's, he's a huge fan. He's a huge fan. He's fast. He's facile. He's dirty. He's He's got all he's playing. And then he had that great. Cavalier style throwing out the cards, like um, Johnny uh, Ethan Phillips does on the cruise when he has. Have you ever seen Ethan's Midnight Blue comedy act on the Star Trek cruise? No, but I can imagine. Oh, <laughs> he has ideas on a three by five card, and he looks at them, and they're and then if he doesn't like it, he just tosses it on the stage. And Lovett is doing exactly the same shtick. It was very entertaining. It's very Letterman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're going to talk to you about your life and your career and stuff like that as much as we could fit in. But I mean, I'm curious. I mean, you're more than Star Trek, but all the big Star Trek people have written memoirs. Patrick just did a big one over COVID and that came out. Nana has a brand new one that's just out. It's kind of more about her and women in Trek. Have you read Nana's yet? I devoured it. I loved it. It's phenomenal. I have Jerry. You- no, I haven't. But Jerry told me about it. And uh Someone else said that. Maybe it was Rosalind Chow. Someone else had read it and said it's really powerful and uh, that she's she tells a very powerful story, apparently. Yeah, I had emotional reactions to it. Yes, that's exactly it. what I heard. Yep. And Brent wrote this bizarre, wonderful con. Is it, is it, is it called the Con Man? Con, con was, con? Right. It's not a memoir. Well, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a fake memoir it's a mock memoir yeah. it's, it's, very, it's very fun but it's, but it's based somewhat on basic. Truth. Yeah, yeah more, more and, than somewhat yeah and you guys got involved in the audiobook that was so where's the you know where is the i mean look, we could come up with the easy names are you know something about number one or Meeting number one or you know <laughs> red, red alert or i mean it's where where is that i mean you know you mean, are, you, are you talking about uh Number two on the call sheet, but number one in your hearts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a better title. <laughs> See, so you've got the title. Where's that's, all the- I, that's, just, that's all I've got. <laughs> but, but have you ever gone down the road? Maybe I should talk to publishers or anything like that? No, I'm not really a writer. I have uh, I can edit scripts and scenes, and but I and also what story? I, what am I going to tell? I mean, I have a. Uh, I do all these, all my, all my shitty stories. I've told <laughs> you and others. How many times can I sing Valare? I mean, it's, I've only got a limited amount of shtick. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's true. Go ahead. Say it, Tony. That's true. <laughs> it's true. I, well, I'm now curious. Put it like that. It's true. It's true. We've heard it all. Well, let's, Thank let's, you. let's go back. I, I, this is this is a bit for Lori, but I want to go back to way in the beginning. So, you know, obviously you're known for what you're known for. But, uh, you know, we saw like an audition tape you did for Welcome Back, Cotter in the 70s. Like when oh, in the 70s, when Anson, you were starting. Anson played that at the lunch on an episode of Discovery one day. Oh, really? <laughs> and it went on and on. It's and long. On. Not only is it long, it cut into the crew's lunch. But it was such a sweet gesture for Manson to go out of his way to find this and then surprise me with it and then try to shame me in front of the crew, which it kind of did. And he's got a he's got a sneaky, sweet heart in him. (laughs) So thinking back to like, you know, that was a sitcom. Like, did you have a vision? I'm going to be a sitcom guy. I know you were on a you were on a soap opera like weird at that time. Where did you see your career or were you just like, I, I just want a job. Like, like when you got that Charlie's angels role, oh. <laughs> which I enjoyed oh. or Hill street blues. I was just watching that one. <laughs> Eight is enough, dude. 
Right. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I was, I would, uh, I just wanted a job. I took any job and I was, uh, very lucky to come out here and be able to, when I was running out of money, it turned out I'd get a gig, I'd get a guest star gig and it would get me through the next month. Or, I, I don't, <clears throat> I didn't have a vision for my alleged career. <laughs> I thought, I thought I had, uh, peaked when I had two points. I wish I thought, well, I've now arrived. I went to do, um, Eugene O'Neill's Anna Christie at Seattle rep with a wonderful actress named Kailani Lee. And I thought, well, this in my, from where I trained, this is the peak. If you're in a Lord, a theater somewhere doing the lead part in a regional theater play, that's the top. And then I got a part on the soap. I got a part in the doctors and I, I played a um, Vietnam vet child beater with a troubled past. And it, it was so, the show was so old that the, they used to do the spinning wheel of when I had bad memories and it would go right into my face and there would be horrible memories of my childhood. And while I was on that show, I got a job in the chorus with a single little uh, scene in Shenandoah, which was playing at Wolf Trap in Virginia. And from that, I was able to replace someone on Broadway. And I got, so I was doing a soap during the day and a Broadway show at night. And I thought there is no higher than this. Then I got killed in the soap and the Broadway show closed and they sent me to LA and I started doing all those shows you just mentioned. So I gave myself, I had a five year plan and I was, uh, first of all, I was the worst waiter in the history of New York, which I'm sure I've told you before. <laughs> Second, and then secondly, I was, um, working as Captain America for Marvel comics, which my <laughs> agent thought was really a bad idea, especially at 50 bucks a day. So then I started to move furniture with some friends of mine for, five dollars an hour and that was horrible on your back and i thought this can't happen forever and then the things i just mentioned happened so i've been i haven't had to uh move furniture for five bucks an hour for for years right. and <laughs> you're standing on the beach with cheryl ladd uh with cheryl ladd, <laughs> and it was supposed to have been the other one who rejected the script she famously threw the script out the door of her dressing room was it north and south was that the moment you're like okay i'm i i've got a career i'm I, this is it i'm i'm staying i'm, uh, I'm north and in. south i was like number 37 on the call sheet i was you know <laughs> i was so i was always on the uh, what they call the swing set you know if the weather got bad they'd uh, take my scene and shoot it inside somewhere so but i did fall in love with my wife there so north and south was a game changer for me yeah even though I've, I've met her on Bare Essence, which you may or may not remember. Oh, oh that, that's a deep cut. There's a deep <laughs> cut. CBS, Jeannie and uh, Lee Grant and uh, wow. all kinds of wonderful people in it. Linda Evans and Joel Higgins. And anyway, I was in that. But, uh, but Jeannie was so much younger than me. I flirted with her in the dressing room or in the makeup trailer. But it was clearly, you know, this girl. And then fast forward, the same producer hired us for, for North and South. And by then she was in her twenties, so it was okay. But so we've been together a long time. <laughs> <laughs> How many years? Thirty nine. Nice. Yeah, I'll say. When is the last time you guys have ever acted together? Was it back way back then, or did you no, have you done did, anything? We did uh, Lois and Clark, which was great. After our kid, one of our children, I remember taking Jamie with us to the studio. I directed her in a great ill-fated series called Bar Karma. Have you ever heard of this show? No. Albie Hecht, who produced Clockstoppers, who's doing an event that I'm going to tonight called The Shine Global, which is a, a uh, awards show for films made for and about uh, children and to give them hope. So that's uh, on, my, on my docket. I should plug that. But Albie produced Clockstoppers and became a friend. And then he had this small kind of uh, one of the Daryls from Daryl, Daryl and the other Daryl from Bob Newhart. Right. For those guys, he was the sort of the name lead and it was a mystical, you went into a bar and in that bar, things changed bar karma, hence the title. And Jeannie played a character with uh, multiple personalities and she was spectacular. In it. And it was, I don't know what network it was on, but it never took off. And then I had, she did, uh, she did a, very funny bit in Thunderbirds where she was a weather person who was, I turned the wind up on her and she was blown off camera. It was very <laughs> funny. So we did a couple of other things together too. At any rate. Never got her into Trek though. 
No, but she was on Roswell. She was the mother of the oh. aliens on Roswell. Ah. I just did their. I just did the podcast for uh, Brendan Fair and Mahandra Delfino because I had seen them at uh, Dragon Con in Atlanta, and I have very fond kind of mixed but fond memories about all that Roswell time together. And they, they were the, they were just. I mean, they reminded me, especially Mahandra, that she was seventeen or something when the show started, and she's now got oh. two kids and lives in Maine. And it's weird getting old. Look at your <laughs> look at your beard, Tony. I mean, do you remember when your beard was black? Oh God, I can't believe you remember that. That's true. That's I don't true. think I even knew you then. Oh no, no, the early, you know, the maybe, early, yeah, in the early days, sir, in the way back in the way back machine. Yeah, um, you were the first Star Trek actor to make the transition to directing in your era, right. and you know, I, I, I'm curious who went to who first, you or Rick? I went hat in hand because it became clear to me that this was the opportunity. This was the opportune time. And I didn't understand the old adage that uh, I guess Mitchum is given credit for that. Um, they pay you to wait. I act for free. <laughs> <laughs> and you can only take so many naps. I mean, Brent's a great napper and he could nap all the time. But I, so I was stir crazy. If I was waiting between scenes, I would often go back onto the set. And clearly the hub of the set is around where the director and the DP and the, you know, so I loved the, I loved the juice of both sides of the camera right from the beginning. And I had directed a little bit in college, but not on camera. So it was the opportunity was there. And I think Rick reluctantly let me direct it, but it wasn't until the third late in the third season. And as Kismet would have it, it was, I was very ready by that point. Cause I, I had, I think I've probably been through this before. I did, I did like 300 hours in the editing room with these guys who were also wanted to be directors and were Letterman and others who um, who were really generous with their time and their knowledge, which I still use when I'm at the end of the day. And I, and we're, and I know we're fucked and we're over. And I see the producer walk on the set, and the producer always says, "So have you got a you got a plan for this, Frakes? You going to get us out of this?" And I said, "Yeah, I, we'll be fine. We can do this last thing in an hour and a half or whatever." So you learn to simplify based on what you know the editor needs. They bear bones of what he needs for a scene. And I learned a lot of that in what we call Paramount University. <laughs> and then you did, you know, you directed a bunch of next gens, but then your first non next gen directing job was on deep space nine. How was that? Di- like, was that scarier? How was that different for you? Uh, it was the same. It was the same crew, you know, right? and we had all known each other because I'm not part of Paramount deep space. And then Voyager, we owned those, all those we owned, we lived in all those. <laughs> Boy, there's a Freudian slip there. All those sound stages were ours. So we intermingled and there was no, yeah. And it was because the vibe was the same. Rick was the same producer and a lot of the same writers. Brandon had moved over and Ron had moved over to other. And so there was a lot of familiarity and knew the grips and electrics and the sound mixers and most of the operators. So it became challenging moving on to another show. I'm not sure what the first thing I did Outside of Star Trek, it was may have been Diagnosis Murder or University Hospital or one of those shows. And um, it was such a different animal. And you took your, uh, you didn't have the Star Trek to lean on. But it was, it was good for me to have shadowed so many directors for so long before being given a show. How come you never did Enterprise? Like, to direct it? I think I was doing um, Clock Soppers and then... Librarians. I think I was frankly working on other shows, if I'm not mistaken. I was also. I think it was so. I were doing Nemesis. That show was on. Maybe does that make sense? Yeah. You, and and I think Thunderbirds too. You know. Yeah. So it's the early 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So but Librarians I, I, is a fun show. Librarians yeah. is fabulous. It's so fun to watch. Rebecca Romaine just blows me away when I watch that show. Yeah. And the early like the first the Librarians movies with Bob Newhart and Jane Curtin yeah. and Olympia Dukakis and the great Noah Wiley. That's where um Dean Devlin got me out of movie jail. I was licking my wounds in Maine after the the dive that uh, Thunderbirds took and Dean said, "I can you go to Africa because uh, I'm going to be doing something else and I need you to direct this TV movie and the studio won't let me use the original guy because he didn't have enough and i said uh, you know i said what do you think can i go to africa and direct <laughs> direct a movie yeah i'm, I'm in you know, it, it's common parlance that in 
in TV, the executive producer's the king. In movies, the director's the king. So you brought in to direct your first feature film, First Contact. Who was king? You or Rick? Rick. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> and then me. <laughs> like, did you, were you happy with that? That I'm directing a feature film, but I'm kind of, I'm not really in charge the way a feature film director should be. That didn't bother me at all. It, it wasn't as if we were changing. We were just, you know, it, it was a bulletproof script. It could not have been a better script. Um, we were blessed with those three or four wonderful guest stars with Cromwell and Alfrey and Alice Krieger, who f- somehow fit in our family like that. Um, I had Matt Leonetti, who was a big time cinematographer. So he helped me through the transition into the fact that we don't have to do eight pages a day. We could do four pages a day. So I didn't have any of that kind of, uh, what is the word? I didn't have that auteur need or vision. I, I was really happy to do the best version of starting because I knew everybody and we knew what, you know, we knew what the relationships were like. So I wasn't inventing a new wheel, which is, I think what happened with um, Nemesis that Stuart wanted to somehow put his spin on it as a director. And I remember offering to, you know, is there anything I could do to help you? I've done a lot of these. I know all these guys. Patrick said the same thing. I know you, you know, do you want to have lunch? And he was really, he resisted the idea of, I guess, getting in deeper. He, it, Bonding? It, maybe. What, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but it used to be when you guest starred on a show. I remember uh, Andy Griffith did this and um, someone else. They took the guest star who was a kid like me out, out to lunch and they kind of welcome you to the business in a way that was so spectacular and, and is, you know, still lives in my heart. Matlock, I think that was on. You're passing the baton. You're, you've got, you're mentoring new people who do the If you're bringing somebody into a franchise, it seems to me, I like Alex Kurtzman asked me for an introduction to Berman. And then Berman and Alex Kurtzman famously went out to dinner for hours and, you know, schmoozed about life and Trek. And I just think that there's a certain part of being in this family that is a shared experience and also a, a, a collective, if you excuse the Borg pun. <laughs> You've directed so much Trek. Are you going to be doing uh, Starfleet Academy? I certainly hope so. Yes, it looks like it's going to work out. That's why I was able to read these scripts. I got some copies of the Starfleet Academy scripts, which are, by the way, spectacular. Nice. Funny. Oh, action-packed and funny. I haven't been on those sets, but I understand the set is the uh, most magnificent Star Trek set yet. Have you heard about the sets on Starfleet Academy? Yeah, they're sh- shooting on the largest stage. Like, in, yeah, in the ever. biggest stage. <laughs> yeah, and they they built the they just built Starfleet Academy in a giant soundstage, and they hired movie stars. They got Holly Hunter. They got Paul Giamatti. That's have you worked with either one of them before? I haven't, but I have worked with Bob Picardo <laughs> <laughs> and Tig Notaro. <laughs> and, and Tig, oh God bless Tig, and also uh, Odette Mary Fair. Wiseman. Yeah. Has Mary been announced officially on the show? Yeah. Yeah. Mary, Mary Oded. Yeah. They, they've announced uh, the, who's recurring, who's a regular, all of it, pretty much. The whole cat, all the kids, obviously. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, Giamatti, I, I take a tiny bit of um, credit for Giamatti <laughs> because we, because we, you know, a friend of mine in, in Europe did a thing with him where he auditioned to play Klingon and we promoted that. And apparently Kurtzman saw that and said, oh, my God, he's a fan. And they reached out to him and he's like, I'll do anything. But I want to be the villain. So, you know, and he wanted a much bigger role than they initially were thinking, too. He's got a yeah. fabulous part. Oh, really? Tell us everything. What race? Gonna, well, can you tell us if he has prosthetics <laughs> dude, or not? dude. dude. You know, B, I get in so much fucking trouble yeah. with CBS. Yeah, yeah. We're, no, we're not going to. Don't put yeah, that we're... bird seat out in front of me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, I, I mean, I, I okay, I'm going to put a little bit of bird seed because you've already done it, which is you've said for season, I'm, you know, there's so many seasons, but for season three, which Strange you've already World. shot, Strange New Worlds, you're doing a, quote, Hollywood murder mystery. Yes. And they've talked a little bit about this and they've kind of a, like – so at first I just thought, oh, you know, we've seen mystery episodes, uh, you know, whodunits. But is this like like that 
fantasy episode. Like it's, it's like, it is literally like a Hollywood murder mystery. Like we're in an old movie kind of thing. Is that what you mean by that? Oh man, I'm not getting oh, anything out not, of it. <laughs> he's not taking the bird seat. It's not, is it in black and white? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not in black and white. <laughs> okay. Uh, good question. Well, though. Fair question. Yeah, we uh, did you, think you, it was probably in black and white. It's fabulous. Another bulletproof script, by the way. Is it funny? Yes. Is that is that what they're going for in that, I guess, is the question. That's what I go for anywhere. Right. All levity aside, I look for the levity because <laughs> Star Trek is generally so serious that if you can find any, even the nuanced look to let the audience, because the audience wants to laugh and wants to smile and wants to, even when things are heavy. And one of the reasons that uh, First Contact was successful, I think, was because we built the tension, built, 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 and then to be something like Marina's drunk scene. With, I was just going to uh, yeah. say. <laughs> and ah, oh, I can enjoy that. And we built the, you know, then the, the stakes go back, you know, it, without that, there's no, there's no building for two hours. There's got to be music. that has got to be played through the whole thing. And um, this script has, has that. Let's go big picture for a second. This is a very uh, transitive time for the franchise Ooh, and yeah. the industry. What about the uh, section 31? Well, what do you, I mean, did you have any, like, was there ever a possibility you were going to be involved in that? I mean, it was always Tunde who was going to direct it's that. It's Tunde's right? baby. Yeah, Tunde has that. Tunde's number one. Tunde is, um, he was the producing director on Discovery, which sort of launched all of the new Trek. He's a really wonderful filmmaker and a wonderful man and a good heart and a big brain. And he's he was the right guy for the job. And he had done more with uh, Michelle, certainly, than I had. I, don't, I think I only had her in a couple of episodes. And Kurtzman, Kurtzman and Tunde have a very strong relationship. There was never any doubt who, who was going to do 31. I, what was, I thought, most amazing was that the first thing she signed on to do after winning an Academy Award was to come back to Trek, which I think yeah. speaks volumes about her loyalty and her, or I don't know what it speaks to, but it speaks to our good fortune. <laughs> it's, I think it speaks to her having a great time. Yeah, she does like to have a good time. That yeah. much I can assure you of. <laughs> the last time you were here, we talked a little bit about this idea of these Star Trek streaming movies. And, you know, Paramount is in a world of transition, obviously. Ooh. But you, they had, they had a rough week last week, didn't they? Yeah. Last it, couple of weeks have been bad. You mean with all the layoffs? Or, yeah. 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 I mean, well, that, yeah. I mean, they, they're, you know, they're cutting half a billion dollars um, and that's before Skydance comes in and they're going to cut more. But at least they're keeping the company together. Some of the other vultures out there wanted to slice it into pieces and sell off the lot and all that, you know. So uh, uh, we've got that going for us. But, you know, just look, looking at the streaming movies, I think you hinted that you, do you see this as a model? Have you heard people inside saying a regular series of streaming movies might be a a new path forward for Star Trek and streaming? I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that that is a, I think in terms of uh, scheduling people like Michelle Yeoh, obviously. And as you asked the question, I was reminded of the short treks. Remember those great short treks? Yeah. 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 Raybon did. And Aldous was in one of them. And uh, uh, Rain, Rain was Wilson. in. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they, they were really intriguing in fact so this is in, in or at least it feels to me in the gestalt of it that there's sort of a potentially a longer version of that i mean it, there's a if you make a two-hour movie i mean are not if you're making a two-hour movie are you not really making a pilot anyway but if you're making a two-hour movie as a two-hour movie which the section 31 is and it does well it's less of a risk than saying i need money to make five seasons of a new show so I would suspect that I think it's naive to pretend that people aren't looking to it and to see how it does. You know, there's there's two ways to go. You do another Section 31 movie or maybe you do the legacy as a movie or at least a backdoor pilot. You know, do, you know, we, th that's a different way to go to say, OK, here's another idea, kind of like short treks in a totally different theme, totally different vibe, totally different director, maybe maybe one that r rhymes with snakes you know freaks on a plane freaks on a plane <laughs> <laughs> that 
That's the title of your memoir. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've talked to Terry about this. I think if legacy is ever going to happen, it's almost – this is the only way it's going to happen. Yeah. Is it – or at least to start with, do you agree with that? I do. How did you feel when you when you opened the trades? You may have known before that and you saw that Kevin Feige plucked Terry away. Well, I wasn't surprised because Terry had taken me to Kevin Feige's 50th birthday. And it's oh. this that I go. I said, I don't even know Kevin Feige. He said – Dude, I think he actually said, trust me, which is always the kiss of death. So I went with with, uh, Terry and his wife, and I met Feige, who kind of fanboyed on me and all things Star Trek at his own birthday. And I said, oh, (laughs) I get it. Then we had dinner. You were the birthday present, by the way. Him taking you. I know Terry. He brought you as a birthday present for Feige because Feige's such a super fan. And we had a nice dinner with Feige, with uh, Terry and uh, LeVar and Brent and I. So I was I was not surprised, and it's uh, it's Marvel's and he's psyched about this. The Paul Bettany thing. What is it called, by the way? Um, well, it's about Vision. So I think Vision's in the title, but I I don't know the name. But it's 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 the show about Vision, basically. Yeah, and it's going to shoot in England. I hadn't read that, you know. But you know, they're they're bringing in um, Todd, obviously, because it's yeah. Terry. Yeah. Um, oh, I Todd, be some- Todd's in training. I know. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> any, any chance you're going to direct for him? I would love to. I have not heard anything to that end. I wasn't surprised, but and I knew it was coming, but I, it's just a loss for CBS had him sitting on deck. He was begging to do it, and he you know, he had an overall deal with CBS, and now he's he's been hired by you know he's also doing a the reboot of something else, and you know he's he's you know Picard season three launched a, a whole you know, relaunched his career, but he was waiting to bring you guys back. For even more. Yeah, but there was, there was a lot of Star Trek already in place. I mean, the Starfleet Academy was already in the mix. Section 31 was in the mix. Strange New Worlds was already in the mix. I mean, it was it was ambitious of us all to to think that we were going to move up the pecking order. But I, I think that uh, – and Terry's talent is undeniable. So it's, it's, it's great that he's working. He's also doing an animated show for um, Netflix. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. It's just with the other shows ending, you'd think there would. I mean, obviously, with things at Paramount now, it's not like they created a space and there's a big bucket of money waiting. No, it's, um, yeah, which I think is really at the core of all these questions anyway. If it were 2019, you would be shooting Legacy right now. Yeah. 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 But it's obviously not anymore. (laughs) I just want to do a time check. We're at 35. You know, we've got half an hour more of our own questions asked but i i don't want to take up your day i'm okay so should should I'm okay. okay i forgot I, I forgot how compelling you guys were <laughs> Lori. why don't you go back to that um insurrection question oh okay i mean insurrection i've heard whenever people bring up insurrection with you you often just say like all oh, those white people which is you well, know that, a, le- a legit freaked, critique yeah freaked a lot of us out the baku But it's a fun, I think it's a fun movie, but how successful do you feel it was? Like, are you, other than that, like, are you happy with it? Are there things you'd change? Oh, I liked it. I thought it came out great. I only had uh, that element of it pointed out to me, first of all, while we were shooting. If we had talked about it during the development of the movie, it may have been different or it may not. I mean, there must have been some, somebody must have discussed it, like all these things. This was Pillar and Rick, so I was the guy to shoot it. Again, it was not like a regular movie where the director has the juice. And I remember shooting out there in uh, Sherwood Lake, Lake Sherwood, where the Baku village was a real beautiful set that uh, Zimmerman built. No, we had a ball in that movie. And that was Brent Spiner's like genius with the uh, smooth as an android's bottom comes from that movie, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> the... Uh, Hot tub shaving scene with Marina Sirtis comes from that movie. Lavar's uh, seeing the sunrise. Yeah, there's a lot of real and the wonderful romance with uh, Donna Murphy with Patrick. I thought was spectacular. There was a lot of and we that was when we we did uh, time lapse. Uh, it took forever because you had to re-record a hundred times. You had to put the four hundred cameras on it, and it was and now you can just turn a switch on the machine and shoot that kind of 
Are, are you surprised it didn't do better? I mean, Brent told me that Paramount had big hopes. You guys, he said his biggest payday in Star Trek was, or this is before Picard, was for Insurrection. Um, I think you had a bigger budget than First Contact. So were you surprised that it didn't do better? And do, does it ever, do, you know, you know, just thinking on Next Gen, like, do you know when something's going to be big and when something isn't? Or are you always surprised? Always surprised. It was the, <laughs> it was the curse of the odd number, perhaps. I love Michael Piller. I don't think the it was written as a movie. It was written as a two part episode. It felt too much like a TV episode to me. I think there there was an I don't know. I I could do a whole hour in insurrection. Yeah, Tony and I argue <laughs> about it sometimes because I really liked that aspect. I thought it had a great story. Well, it's funny at conventions. People, I always had these schmoozes with everybody, and I ask them if they're watching the new stuff, and you, and they'll the ones who come up to the table who are talking hardcore Star Trek. Some of them will make it very clear that Insurrection is, in fact, their favorite movie, and they always defend it. They said, I know everybody likes First Contact, and I know Wrath of Khan is the best of them and all, but they, the uh, insurrectionists yeah. are um, are very loyal. In my And maybe this is because I'm always thinking about the business side, but I think when you're making a movie, you need to make a movie, mm-hmm. you know, and – it's kind of like the difference between Star Trek Four and Star Trek Three. Star Trek Three is a much better Star Trek movie, but Star Trek Four is a much better movie because it's trying to be a movie and it's trying to appeal to everyone. And I think First Contact, you could take your girlfriend, go to First Contact, have a great time. It's got space zombies, yada yada. Insurrection, great Star Trek two part episode, really well, good I, character I think stuff. They, I think maybe you've captured the the difference, and that is that First Contact, you didn't need to know anything about Star Trek. Yeah, insurrection. You did have to have some history with the franchise or with the characters or with next gen. Yeah, I think that's probably maybe at the core of it. Still made money. Oh yeah, it's also what was sort of charming about it was that f- those of us who wanted to see those characters, it wasn't just events; it was characters. Yeah, it's great, ca- great character stuff. Let me. I mean, let you know. Obviously, you just did great. Your great work on Picard, and we were talking about the longevity of the franchise. Do you feel you will ever play William Riker again? Absolutely. Nice. Halloween's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like you've left anything on the field, though? No. <laughs> I have to be some new material. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, all kidding aside, I thought that, ter- again, to go back to Terry, the stuff that Terry wrote for Riker in Picard Season 3 was as good as anything I ever got to play and as strong and as, as I remember going into or I, I remember Riker going into Picard's quarters when the, we were sort of at the emotional bottom of our story. And I said, we're all going to die. And it was such a great scene. It was so simple and so powerful and it was so easy to do with Patrick and, and then throwing his ass off the bridge was a great moment in <laughs> Frakes and Riker's life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Picard season three was, I mean, it was magnificent in a lot of levels, but it was selfishly f- wonderful for me because I got to do every episode and, the, and uh, the character was all dense and they put the 20 years in there that all of us had experienced like they did with LeVar's story. It was, that's why Marvel cherry picked Terry. <laughs> right. I loved your scene with uh, with Marina when you were both in the cell and you were talking over oh. your history, like because she never gets to do stuff like that on Star Trek either. So that was really she's so underused; it's a sin. I think she's got yeah. a new series. I think she's about to start something new in England. She's a magnificent actor. Yeah, she could. She, she I, I mean, I've talked to her. I think she feels, and I feel that Picard season three didn't use her well enough. Terry's very persnickety when I brought that up, but there was the issues with her availability yeah, and why yeah. she wasn't it later in the season. Yeah. But the early earlier in the season she was very poorly used, I yes. thought. And then no yeah. comment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean the th- the thing I find interesting is like on Next Gen, like Riker, once they started putting some of you into Riker, the more they put in, he became a more interesting and engaging character. And I always felt like with Marina, they they missed the chance to put more of her yeah. into that character because yeah. she's got so much life. Yep, very very good observation, I think. And and that we did see some of that in uh, when we got her in Picard season three. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. And first contact even she got to like oh, she play some well. comedy finally. Yeah. 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 Speaking of comedies, have you talked to Tawny about her comedy? Do you think you let's say that gets greenlit, her um her you know, the office and the space office situation? Space, yeah. Yeah, would you feel comfortable doing straight up sitcom? Have you ever directed a sitcom? And- I've never directed a sitcom, but I'm ready to. I'm directing a music video in a couple of weeks, which I think should be interesting. Oh. But I have um, anything with Tawny. Tawny is the, uh, and Kurtzman will tell you, Tawny's one of our real new secret weapons in the in the family. Well, she's, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's others, but you could, I'm sure she's one of the big reasons why you were saying Academy has a great lighter tone because she's there in the writer's room. Mm. Have you talked to her about her comedy with, um, with Justin Simeon? Yeah, I have. She's great, by the way, Tawny. Have you had her on your show? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. We could just talk Trek with her. Like she's such a fan. Oh, she's deep. She is as yeah. deep as uh, Kristen Beyer or... Cat Lynn or any of these people who are really, really deep dive authorities on this stuff. She is as deep as any of them. Yeah. She was on uh, After Midnight last night. Oh, with yeah, with Jerry. With Jerry and, and, I, and Rebecca? Yeah, and they did some, like, she actually did some fact-checking, you know, where they got something, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, you know, she's she's the real deal, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So you were just on the Katie Sankoff show. You were talking about your relationship with Ron Moore. Has that has that aired? I just watched it before we did this. Oh, yeah. Because the state of Star Trek is 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 as we were saying in flux. It's possibly going to go through a radical change. We could see the end of the current era and the beginning of a new era. Uh, you know, and and I'm just curious if you've had a chance to because you know, I know he has big ideas. Yeah. You know, does does he talk about? He's a know, man. He's he's got very big ideas. <laughs> I'm waiting for his show. We're really big fans of For All Mankind. In this I movie. love yeah. that show. I'm not sure how much he has his hands in it anymore, but he's a, uh, he's a very gifted man and a very sweet man. And we, we get together for sushi whenever he's in town and we talk Trek and we talk dreams. He's also a, got a little, uh, high school band thing that we have in common that, uh, either he's working on or something, but yeah, he's got, he's got great big ideas. And I think he'd be happy to come back into the fold. So you think if David Allison called him and says, we're going to buy you out of your Sony contract and put you, make you Kevin Feige, he'd take the gig, you think? See, I can't answer that kind of question. <laughs> you are leading the fucking witness. <laughs> <laughs> Would make Star Trek fans pretty happy. <laughs> yeah. But Allison must be a Star Trek fan, wouldn't you think? He is, I think, right? Well, I mean, you know, he 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 backed a couple movies. Those were, you know, investments, but you know, they were involved and he did bring up Star Trek during his investor call. So, he's, you know, he's Trek friendly. Isn't he isn't he doesn't he support JJ? Yeah, as I was saying, he backed, you know, Skydance backed, you know, but they backed Mission Impossible, they backed a few other, you know, so they you know, basically Paramount doesn't have money most m- many studios to do a two hundred million dollar movie, so they always go out for outside financing. Skydance early on was one of those outside financing companies, but they kind of he leveraged that to become a producer. He's like, I'm not just going to give you money; I want to be a real right. producer. And so now Skydance has grown into a production company, and now they've actually bought you know Paramount. But I would not be surprised if him and Jeff Shell did a you know did a page one rewrite on star trek and they said let's 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 rethink the whole thing movies tv let's start over where would that where would that start in your mind well they'd wind down all the current streaming shows they'd take a look at the two movies in development they and uh they'd bring in new talent what happened what happened to uh tarantino and josh holly well tarantino you know he's tarantino and he wanted to do other things and you know it's like I don't know why they ever got involved in that because if he's not going to direct, who cares, right? Like, who's going to make? Right. He was like, you know, he didn't story, write it, yeah, yeah, and it's it's like story by Tarantino is not enough to sell that movie. Holly was a money thing, so I mean, this is you know, the, the sound of the klaxon. I'm going to get into the weeds, but uh, before you so, get into the weeds, let's wrap it up. Okay, it was money basically, yeah. and 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 that's and, where that's where it is like this with me. 
Yeah. Uh, me too. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was, it was, it was changing of the guard too, which I think you went through a couple of times where a new production executive oh, yeah. comes in. So the new executive came in and said, you know, I don't like this. Let's bring back Chris Pine. And that was that. I love that we didn't get into the weeds. I have a fun question from back in the day that Shoot. involves no weeds. Good. Um, <laughs> I interviewed a couple of years ago. I had a, did a great interview with Spencer Garrett. Ah, uh. just I mean that guy. I could write ten articles with him. He was incredible. His whole career is amazing. But he talked about how you because he said when he first guest starred on Next Gen and he was still working as a he was working at a restaurant and then you guys all came in because apparently you had a weekly music gig. Yeah, up at uh, I used to sat sit in with a band at a place called uh, L.A. Nicola's up in Silver Lake on Tuesday nights, and Spencer was there. And so, did you go? He said that everybody would come and play. Like no, I, I played occasionally. Dorn would come in. Nobody else played. Oh, okay. So his memory's a little. He's like Whoopi would come and watch. That was his memory of it. Maybe, maybe once. Maybe once. <laughs> He also, I'm just Spencer, curious about Spencer this. Spencer just finished a show in Korea, I think. Yeah, he's busy. He's yeah. never not busy. You know who his girlfriend is? Yes, Dana Bash. Yeah. He's a really interesting, he's a friend of mine's uncle. That's how I made the yeah. connection. He's a wonderful um, actor, too. I, I said, use him whenever I can. <laughs> he's Yeah, he said you called him for Picard to play Maddox, which John Ailes ended up. Is that true? Probably, yeah. Probably, I think he he didn't age as well as uh, Ailes. Ailes brought a whole different animal to it. I had worked with Ailes before as well. I worked with John Ailes. He was the host of a game show that I produced. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's a right. I think I had him on um, uh, the show in Miami. Yeah, he said I reached out to him after that, and he said he'd worked with you before and loves yeah. you. Which he was great says. as Maddox, by the way. Yeah, Maddox, Maddox. Well, let's wrap up with the game, you know, the talk show moment. What do you got coming up? We know you got this murder mystery, Strange New World season three. What's in the can of you as an actor or director that fans could look forward to coming up in, you know, the next year or so? I'm developing a uh, Arthur C. Clarke project called Venus Prime with David Corcoran that we're hoping will take off. I'm hoping to go up to Toronto and participate in the uh, Starfleet Academy. I've got a couple of other projects, one with Mark Altman. And it's um, it's good. I'm I'm plenty busy, and all and life is good. Weren't, weren't you and Brent doing some That's, travel show? That, thing? Has, that hasn't gotten any um, financing yet. The Brent and Johnny okay. show, yeah. Wow. The wish fulfillment, Brent. That that's still. We talk about that every time we see each other. So that is uh, still a work in progress. And and are you on season four of Strange New? I mean, it's not next. It's they're shooting next year. But yeah. are you booked? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so you're a bit busy guy. Thank God. For an old white guy, not bad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well done, guys. Live long. <laughs> Thank Prosper. you so much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, that was our interview with Jonathan Frakes. You know, at the very beginning, he talked a little bit in the interview about um, Starfleet Academy. But before we were recording, <laughs> when he <laughs> thought that we were recording, um, he was really singing its praises, saying he'd seen a bunch of scripts and they were really great. Like he was very, very enthusiastic and positive about it. So that's you know a good vote of confidence. I mean, you know, Academy could surprise us all. It could just. Oh, I'm be- actually looking forward to it now. I'm I'm on board with with Tony Newsom in the writers' room, and Paul Giamatti, and Holly Hunter, and all the Star Trek people. All like uh, I'm in. I'm Ricardo, in. you know, yeah, Mary Wiseman, Tig, come on, Oded Fair, my boy. Yep. I know your boy, my girl, we're all set. And, you know, in Frakes We Trust. So there we go. You know, <laughs> I want that on all my money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I was, you know, it just, it was a lot of fun. I was, I is interesting to hear his thoughts and how he has no doubt he's going to come back as Riker someday in some form. I, I still don't know how, how or when that's going to happen, but I'm glad to th- know that he thinks it's going to happen. Yeah. He's been the great. Like, you know, the great bridge between yeah. old Trek and new, and he's kind of brought a whole bunch of people with him, and he introduces the new folks to the older fo- It's just been, you know, it's glorious, and I think he was the perfect person to get for our 200th. Absolutely. Now I'm going to start planning our 300th. <laughs> so um, let's do some quick bits of the week. You start. Okay. Mine is 
Lower Decks uh, related. I, I love a good corporate synergy and Paramount Global <laughs> actually used their, you know, giant media corporation to promote uh, the upcoming season of Lower Decks by bringing Tawny Newsom, Eugene Cordero and Jerry O'Connell to their late night talk show, which comes on after Colbert called After Midnight. Um, it was very fun, very funny. It's kind of a game show format. Uh, Rebecca Remind showed up and they played kind of Star Trek themed games. You could watch clips on our site. And I'm just, you know, I'm glad to see them. It would be nice to get these people on Colbert. Like, you know, how did they not bring Sonequa onto Colbert for the final season? You know, it's like, it's yeah, crazy. I don't know. Maybe she did the CBS morning show when she was in New York. I forget. But uh, come on, Paramount, you're a big company. You have the biggest, you know, you have a giant network. Use it, please. No, I knew I have a talk show host who loves Star Trek. Right. With Colbert. Yeah. 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 But, it, you know, but it, it was very it was a lot of fun on After Midnight. And I hope we see them do this again with other casts as well. Yeah. All right. Well, mine is, of course, something I learned on the Delta Flyers. So this is my monthly mention of the Delta Flyers. <laughs> okay. and it's about, but it's not about Star Trek. It is about Armin Shimmerman, who said they were talking about jobs they had. And he said, as a young man, I had the golden opportunity to babysit at a nudist camp. So here's a new fact for you. <laughs> when he was about 13 or 14, he was asked by like some neighbors that he knows a friend that he was working for or something could you babysit my kids while we're at we want to go out to the movies we're at this nudist camp so <laughs> they said you don't have to be nude the kids won't be nude but it's at this nudist camp and he mentioned that since he was only 13 or 14 they did ask some neighbors to check on them occasionally and some of the neighbors who checked were in fact nude nice <laughs> some had bathrobes but that was just a new fun fact <laughs> well, there's yeah, there's another Star Trek actor that needs to do a memoir, or has Armin? No, Arm, well, Armin wrote a fiction book recently, but did he? He's do written a, a bunch of books actually, but I don't think he's done a memoir. Yeah, hmm. I mean, I think between Armin and his wife Kitty, they would actually have a great memoir if they did one together, because she has had a very interesting life. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, before we go, just another programming note. Next week, we're going to do the Comic-Con news. We're going to review two episodes. So Thursday, October 24th, Lower Decks premieres with two episodes. Lori and I have already seen both of them. So, you know, spoiler alert, we love them, right? I did. Yeah. What yeah, did you so think? Did I. No, yeah. I love them. I was yeah, like, oh, have- I missed the show. Yep. So uh, see you next week. See you after Comic-Con. <laughs>